Ultra MG. Ultra MG. This premium blend of four types of synergistic magnesium was designed for optimal metabolic support. Recent studies by the Department of Agriculture show that almost 80% of Americans are magnesium deficient, and the problem is even greater for those with gluten issues. Your body is incapable of producing magnesium on its own, yet it's required for hundreds of enzymatic systems that regulate biochemical reactions in your body. Magnesium is involved in helping your body convert food into energy, creating proteins from amino acids, creating and repairing DNA and RNA, contributing to the structural development of bone, contraction and relaxation of muscles, regulating neurotransmitters, just to name a few. The key to increasing magnesium is proper absorption. With Ultra MG, your body will receive the forms of magnesium right for you and the synergy of the four magnesium forms increases the body's ability to absorb the supplement properly. Ultra MG Premium Magnesium delivers its highly bioavailable magnesium forms as ionized glycinate, ascorbate, citrate, and C16 and 18 alkyls for maximum absorption. Like all of our products, Ultra MG is gluten-free. It also doesn't contain wheat, any dairy products whatsoever. It's free of soy, it's free of yeast, and any GMOs, preservatives, or other additives. Now for daily use, take three capsules a day in divided doses with or without food. If you're looking for enhanced performance, you can take four to six capsules a day in divided doses with food. If you're looking for sleep support, you can take two capsules 30 minutes before bedtime. And if you're looking for support of your bowel function, take six to eight capsules a day and divided doses with food. And as always, consult your healthcare provider to discuss your specific medical needs before you start a supplementation program. Hey everybody, welcome to Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. We are gonna be taking your live questions today. Um, don't forget, we're gonna to try to keep the focus to the autoimmune reducing capacity of the no grain, no pain diet. If you missed Tuesday's show, we dove deep into phase one of the no grain, no pain autoimmune elimination diet. And so if you missed that, um, we'll put a commentary or a link below that you can go back and review you know, the first two weeks of that protocol. Now, coming up next week, we're going to be reviewing phase two, so stay tuned for that as well. Um, but again, if you've got questions you want me to answer those today, go ahead and type those into the chat box. We'll do our best to get those answered. Also, don't forget to pay a visit to our sponsor, Gluten-Free Society. Right now, you can take advantage of the New Year sale on genetic testing for gluten sensitivity. Just use coupon code uh, DNA70, I believe, and save $70 on your genetic testing for gluten sensitivity. So don't forget to tap into that. Now, let's dive in to your questions. Let's see, Debbie's asking about soy. Uh, are there any certain types of soy that young men should avoid? My opinion is young men should avoid all types of soy. Soy is really all, not all that great of a food. It has a 
health connotation largely because of the plant-based movement, the vegetarian movement in the 60s and 70s. And so soy had this, um, this really popular marketing ploy to, to gain popularity around being a health food. But in reality, today, soy, 95 to 99% of it in the U.S. is genetically modified. Uh, one reason I wouldn't recommend it, another reason why I wouldn't recommend it is that um, you have glyphosate being sprayed on it twice. So it's double doused in poison and it's genetically modified. Um, and young men, you know, one of the other aspects to soy is that soy contains different types of plant-based estrogen compounds that for young developing men, in my opinion, is not a good idea simply because we live in an over estrogenic world. Think of all the ways we get artificial estrogens already. We get them through plastics. We get them through petrochemical byproducts. We get them through cosmetics. We get them through pesticides. And uh, you know, throw soy into that mix, and it's just one more way that a young man can be overexposed to compounds that mimic estrogen. And that's just not a good thing for developing young men. I honestly believe that this is one of the reasons this, this high level of estrogen that we're seeing over the last 30 to 40 years is one of the reasons why we see more and more young men uh, who are gay, who are, you know, who are confused uh, around gender. I should say maybe confused is the wrong word. They are biochemically, um, in, in a sense, being castrated. And we see this in animals and, and reptilians and fish. So we know it happens. Like when we expose, uh, for example, um, if you look at atrazine, which is one of the most common weed killers, um, it's commonly found in our water supply. And if you look at how it affects fish and frogs and salamander, it chemically castrates the males and they start laying eggs, they actually turn into females. And so with all of this artificial estrogen that we're being exposed to, I have zero doubts in my mind scientifically that this is one of the reasons why we are seeing more homosexual behavior. Uh, and and it, to me, that's a, that's a tragedy. And it's not an offend, I'm not offended by people who are gay or living a gay lifestyle. I'm just simply stating facts. So. At any rate, I don't think any young men should be exposed to high quantities of soy-based food, particularly considering the estrogenic compounds. Uh, let's see here. Barbara says, thank you for opening our eyes to dangers of modern food. Your book was life-changing, and I've shared it with a number of friends. While I'm not gluten sensitive, I cut out 90% of grains from my diet, also switched to grass-fed beef, lamb, and buy produce from local farmers. Okay, so not a question, more of a commentary. Thank you, Barbara, for, for that commentary. I'm glad the book has been a life-changing um, uh, information for you. Uh, Linda says, I feel like if I can't get control of my stress, nothing is going to help me. Um, yeah, so let's talk about that for just a minute and, and, and dial it in and connect it to No Grain, No Pain. So if we look at fundamentally what we're doing with the No Grain, No Pain diet to overcome autoimmune diseases, we are removing stress. Right now, there are different flavors of stress, if you will. There's physical stress, which generally is somebody who doesn't get enough sleep and, and doesn't exer or exercises too much, as a general rule, like over too much physical, um, too much physical exertion. And then there's emotional, mental stress, which is you know anything life throws at you. This could be relationships, it could be the loss of a loved one, it could be you know uh, an event in your life that's traumatic for you. Uh, and then we have chemical stress. Chemical stress is, you know, anything that you choose to eat, drink, or consume, whether it be food or, or beverage or, or medications, that has a biochemical impact or effect on your internal chemistry that stresses your internal chemistry. So you have, again, physical, chemical, and emotional stresses. And what we're really trying to do is remove as many of those things as we possibly can. So um, if you can't get your stress under control, yeah, you're very much at a disadvantage for ever recovering. But keep in mind, there are three kinds of stress. And so you start with where you can control stress. You can control your diet. You can control your sleep. You can control your sunshine. You can control your water quality. You can control your exercise. You can control your air quality. You can control who you hang out with, if those people are you know, poisonous to you or if they're not. Like You can have so many points of control over stress inputs. It's just up to you to exercise those points. It's not all or none. You may control some of them super well, others not as well. But as long as you're controlling and your trend is that you're getting better and better and better at protecting yourself from things that could poison you or people that could poison you, then the general trend is you should be seeing improvement and your body will become more resilient with that. So again, don't think of this as an all or none approach. 
Um, you know, sometimes it's baby steps. Sometimes it's small steps that lead to big changes that then give you the strength and courage to take bigger steps that lead to even bigger changes. So hang in there and keep those things in mind. Let's see here. Lisa says, two years ago, my husband and I found no grain, no pain, and it has changed our lives. Never going back. The health benefit and results have been so worth it. Ever grateful, Dr. O. Well, thank you, Lisa. Uh, for that commentary, I, you know, I, I never, I, I never get tired of hearing how it changes people's lives um, because it's was such a big part of my life, and you know, the way I view it, it's God's gift to me is my gift to you guys. Um, I recently heard a naturopath say that if you are consistently waking up around three, that that can signal a liver issue. Have you heard this? Yes, I have, and that is not always true, but it can be. Also, can berberine have toxicity for the liver? In, in high enough doses, anything can have toxicity for the liver. I would, it would say specifically, Emily, how much are you wanting to take? If generally speaking, if you're taking one, 200 milligrams of berberine a day, um, in my experience, that has not been enough for the average clientele that I see to cause you know, elevation in liver enzymes. However, if you've got pre-existing liver problems or you're concerned by that, you, you may, if you're taking it, you may just have your liver enzymes monitored to, to just to check to make sure. Okay, what supplement for, do you have to help with trichotillomania? So more than anything, there's, it's not a supplement, Valerie. Um, trichotillomania, for those of you that don't know, is, is like the obsessive pulling out of hair or plucking of hair. And so we see this a lot. It's, it's more of a mental disorder than anything else. And so there wouldn't be a supplement per se that I would say, take the supplement to get rid of trichotillomania there, but there would be a diet change. I mean, I've seen cases where people had this very same problem going grain free uh, that dramatically reduces. Now there are supplements that you can take that can reduce anxiety or that can support, you know, healthy anxiety response, things like theanine and GABA, uh, can work well. We have a product, a formulation called Ultra Calm, uh, which can work well as, as well. So um, those are things you can do, but I would say supplements not the answer as much as the diet change needs to be the, the foundational course of action that needs to be taken. Uh, in no grain, no pain, can we eat pulses and lentils and beans? You can in phase one but not in phase two. And we're coming to that. We'll go into the depth of that and get deeper with it next week, Kalapi. So um, phase one, you can. Is it recommended that most people take a digestive enzyme, especially people over 40? Um, in general, it's not a bad idea. Digestive enzymes don't hurt you. They can be very beneficial to help support your natural digestion and extrapolation of vitamins and minerals from the food that you eat. So in general, it's you know, it's a good, it can be a good thing to take. Should everyone be on it? Mm, I think there's an argument that can be made that it's not necessary. I mean, you know, a lot of, excuse me, a lot of people that come to me, uh, initially we do put them on digestive enzymes because their levels are low or their pancreas or the GI tract are not, are not producing adequate digestive enzymes. So in those cases, it's extremely effective and helpful, but it, not everybody falls in that category. Now, you know, again, I'm generalizing for you. Um, a lot of people with a history of gluten reaction, remember gluten damages the GI tract and it can damage the pancreas's ability to make digestive enzymes. So if you're new to the gluten-free diet, it's never a bad idea in general to take a great digestive enzyme for at least for that first six months as you're trying to make that transition with the diet. Now, one of the things that um, I recommend in that case, there's two formulations that I have. One is called Gluten Shield. And, uh, and Gluten Shield is really designed for two things. One, it's designed to help you break down difficult to digest plant-based foods as well as glutens. Okay, so, so it's designed if you get, so for, for example, if you're worried about cross-contamination, Gluten Shield adds a, adds a layer of support for you as you try to navigate learning the gluten-free diet. And then I have another formula, which is a full-spectrum digestive enzyme called Ultra Digest. And that particular formula has enzymes that help you degrade fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. And so that's, uh, you know, that's just one if you're looking for a really good broad spectrum, full spectrum enzyme support. Um, 
Not a question, more of a comment, but I think the comment bears commentary. So I'm just never ever hungry for some reason. Eating makes me nauseous. If you're in that boat, this is Jacqueline's comment, so Jacqueline, being in that boat and anyone else listening in that boat, if eating makes you nauseous and not eating you feel better, you have a food problem. There's a food reaction that you have, um, or you have a digestive problem, meaning you're not digesting food very well, so you get nauseous because you're not breaking food down, and that food actually ends up fermenting in your GI tract, creating gas and nausea and other problems or what you're eating is creating an irritation or an interaction with your immune system within your GI tract, creating nausea and creating problems. So two things that are important to understand. Uh, number one, if, if that's you, uh, one of the best things you can do is, is test yourself. If you're not already gluten-free, obviously test yourself for gluten sensitivity, but also test yourself for other potential food reactions. Uh, we have tests available at Gluten-Free Society. We've made them commercially available without your doctor because most doctors won't order these types of tests. So, um, you know, we can put a link up in the feed uh, to both genetic testing, but also to food sensitivity testing. And then the other thing, you know, the other thing there would be apply intermittent fasting as a strategy in your life until you figure out the other parts. Intermittent fasting is where you have a small window where you eat most of your food for the day, and then you have a larger window where you're not eating at all and giving your gut a break and rest. And so, you know, applying that strategy for some people can be life-changing in terms of comfort and quality of life. So in, consider implementing that fasting, but also get tested, um, don't guess at it. I like this comment. Laura says, nice to finally see your post. I think you've been shadow banned. Well, we've been being shadow banned for the past two years. So. Um, that's why I ask you guys to share it, right? Hashtag save a million lives. It's hard to do when, when all the major social platforms are, uh, are hiding half of your content on a regular basis. Um, so let's, okay, so let's go over. Uh, Don is asking, recently you mentioned something that would cause the skin to feel like, uh, like there were shards of glass. Yeah, that's, that's oxalate. Um, and so, you know, they're, they're oxalates are compounds found predominantly in, in plant-based foods that are tiny crystal structures that some people don't break down very well. And so if you overconsume oxalate, you know, that oxalate will come into your system. And one of the side effects can be that these little glass-like shards can lodge into your tissue and create a lot of pain and inflammation. They're also linked to kidney stones. And the most common type of kidney stone is called a calcium oxalate stone, again, from oxalate. So Donna, the answer is oxalate. And we have, if you want to learn more about oxalate, we have a really comprehensive video and article on that topic. Maybe we can, we can throw that into the feed as well. What, uh, so following up on that question, let's go into the next one that Maria is asking, which is what can cause an overactive bladder? Well, one of the things that can cause an overactive bladder are oxalates. They can irritate the lining of the bladder, causing increased urinary frequency and irritation. Uh, a lot of women that have been diagnosed with um, interstitial cystitis, uh, we find that they actually have high, high oxalate levels and that by going on a lower oxalate diet, they really dramatically improve uh, their symptoms. Uh, so part two of that question is, are vitamin or nutritional deficiencies or toxicities linked to this ailment? I'm already following no grain, no pain. Thank you. So, so they can be, so overactive bladder can also be, uh, there can be a problem with not so much a vitamin or a mineral deficiency so much as a imbalance in the microbiome uh, within your urinary tract. So sometimes we'll see, for example, um, overgrowths of bacteria that are creating irritation that are causing an overactive bladder to occur as well. Um, and then we have other things that cause overactive bladder that are just very common. Um, one would be excessive sugar consumption, which if you're following no grain, no pain, that's probably not your issue. The other would be one of the side effects, one of the hallmark side effects is increased urinary frequency and bladder irritation because your body's trying to pee out mycotoxins and you're in mold and so you're constantly being bombarded by them. And so if, that, if that's something that's new for you, that's relatively recent and you've had like water damage or a roof leak, you, know, you might want to suspect mold as a potential possibility there.
Okay, so um, Lori says, I've had genetic testing uh, for gluten done through LabCorp, but don't understand the results. That's because if you're not a geneticist, it's really hard to interpret them, Lori. You probably get with a good doctor um, and, and get those results interpreted so that you can have a better understanding of them. Um, you might also consider checking out, we'll contact my customer service department, glutenology at, at gmail.com and see if they can register you. We do webinars, we do regular webinars on, on gluten genetics. And so if that's something that may be helpful or interest, you're interested in, call, you know, reach out to my customer service team and maybe they can get you signed up for one of those. Uh, Ron's asking about Siete tortilla chips. Don't we have a review on those, Mel? No, we, not, yet. not yet. So Ron, I've got. Have we done a recent? We, we did a food review for those. So I'm gonna um, I'm gonna put a teaser out there. Pay attention because that's coming your way. We should have that being published uh, probably here within the week or so. So just be patient with us. Uh, let's see here. going. What can I take for acid reflux while being on a gluten-free diet with burning in your chest? One of the things that you might find supportive is um, we, have a, we have a supplement product called GI Soothe, and it's a mixture of different natural compounds that we we call mucilaginous compounds. What they do is they, they coat and line the GI tract. That's why it's called GI Soothe. Um, so you might attempt using that um, if, you know, as you're going gluten-free uh, and struggling with that kind of symptom. If it persists though, I, I certainly would recommend that you follow up with your doctor. Uh, Carrie asks, how do I know what supplements I need? That's a great question. Um, my motto is test, don't guess. You know, you can always go right with a good multivitamin. As a matter of fact, we have, I think we have what's called a gluten-free essentials bundle. So like if you're just flying blind, totally in the dark, not sure you what you should take, but you want to maximize your health and support your health, then the essentials bundle is be where I would start. Now, if you have a good functional doctor who will test you, that's even better. Like that's the cream of the crop and that's what you'd really want to do. We're actually getting ready to introduce direct testing services for nutrition. I know I've been talking about this now for about, what, six months or so, but we're, we're so close, we're almost there. It's, it's actually supposed to happen in the first quarter of this year, so pay attention to that because that's gonna be coming your way. But in the meantime, you might, you might benefit from our gluten uh, essentials bundle, which are, you know, which are key supplements that I recommend anybody new to the no grain, no pain protocol can use very safely and can get great benefit from them. Okay, let's see. Leah says, I've read and love the information in No Grain, No Pain. Can you please remind me of your recommendations for maintaining good levels of short chain fatty acids and good levels of beneficial bacteria um, other than root vegetable, colorful fruits and polyphenols, et cetera, maybe probiotics. Yeah, probiotic would be one of the best ways because short chain fatty acids are, are generated by your good bacteria. So either eating you know healthy amounts of fermented foods. One of my favorite is sauerkraut, um, especially the, the tartar, the more rich in bacteria, right? So if it really puckers your lips, you know you're getting good quality bifido and lactobacillus. Um, but other fermented vegetables would also work. Fermented carrots, fermented cauliflower are options as well. Um, and then beyond that, a good probiotic supplement if, if you're really wanting to increase your, your short chain fatty acid levels, especially your butyrate. Uh, would you give the complete instructions to do a vitamin C flush and how to come out of it, like what to eat after? As Charles is asking. Yeah, so simple, Charles. Um, and we may have, I don't know if we have another like post alluding to that that we could put up in the feed, but very simply put, the vitamin C flush is a, basically it's a cleanse for the gut. So you're cleaning out your gut. It's a one day event and you pick it, you, you pick the time to do it where you have nothing else going on, right? So you make sure that you're staying home today and you're first thing in the morning on an empty stomach. So you don't wanna eat a big breakfast and then try to do a flush because you're just gonna push all that food out of you undigested and it's gonna be irritative to your GI tract. So first thing in the morning in a fasted state, 
you're gonna take two teaspoons of vitamin C powder, and we use Detox C, which is our, our gluten-free blend of buffered um, vitamin C, ascorbate, and uh, you take two teaspoons of that powder mixed in about three ounces of water, stir it really well till all the fizz dies out, and just drink it back, and you're gonna do that every 15 minutes. So two teaspoons of Detox C mixed in three ounces of water every 15 minutes until you start flushing, which what is flushing? That means you're going to the bathroom. Um, you're going to number two. And once you start, quit taking the vitamin C. You don't have to keep continually taking it. You discontinue taking the vitamin C once the flush begins and then just let the flush run its course. For most people, the flush can take anywhere between two and eight hours. This is why I say plan the day to stay home. Don't, don't try to say, I'm gonna, before lunch, I'm gonna do a quick vitamin C flush and then you know, you've got a birthday party or something you've gotta to go to later in the day and you're, you find yourself running to the toilet you know, as you're, as you're trying, to, <laughs> trying to socialize. It's not fun, so don't do that. So plan the day to do the flush and if you finish early, great, but um, that way you don't have any emergencies or bad situations. I, I once had a woman she, uh, she wore white pants to work and thought she could do the flush while she was at work, and I'll just let your imagination do the rest. Not a good idea. Um, let's see here. Maria says, or let's, yeah, Maria says, I have an autoimmune condition called spastic paraparesis, which, uh, oh, okay, spastic paraparesis. Wild rice organic, wild rice exacerbated my condition when I ate it last night. Could it be lectins since it is gluten-free? Yeah, it could be, but it could, but mainly rice, you know, 40% of the population is allergic to grass, Maria. And so wild rice is a grass, it's what it is. And so it could just be that you're reacting poorly to, to grass as a whole. Um, so both are true, both could be true. Um, my advice is listen to your body. If your body rejects a the food, then your body's right. Uh, so, so just pay attention to it. Are oats good for this diet? No. Um, we'll put up, let's put up commentary on oat. Um, our, you know, we have a, a pretty in-depth on our oats. Uh, our oats okay? And a lot of people, because oats are labeled gluten-free, they think, oh, I can do Dr. Osborne's diet and use oats. No, you can't. Not, oats are not gluten-free. They have a type of gluten called avenin, which can be very inflammatory. And uh, so don't recommend it if you're trying to follow no grain, no pain. And several people ask that question, so I just thought, you know, we'll put up that we'll put up that answer in the in the feed here. Ha, I like this. Melanie says, "Do you think eight billion people will accept this diet?" No, I don't. I don't. I don't think honestly. I I don't think seven and a half billion people will accept this diet. I think most people won't accept this diet for the mainly for the reason that. Um, there's a psychology with autoimmunity or with any uh, health condition, and that is a person's health has to, it ha the, the level of their pain has to be greater than their fear of change. And if that's not a true statement, then a person's generally not willing to go through the effort of the learning curve of changing their diet, or they're not willing to admit that diet change has anything to do with their health, and, and that's what most doctors are telling them anyway, so they never even get the information. I think if we wanted to apply the no grain, no pain diet globally, I think it could very easily be done. We as humans are very ingenious um, creatures. And I think we could certainly figure out how to fix farming and we could figure out how to fix the way that we grow foods and raise foods and, and create enough quality food for the entire globe to enjoy and to have vibrant and abundant health with. And I think where we run into our biggest problem is, is greed. You know, we get, you get major corporations who have major industry and operations around food. They're growing it cheap. Um, they're, they're, they're maximizing their production while minimizing the quality of their, out, of their product, which minimizes the quality of the health of the people eating it, which maximizes the efficiency of how much medicine people take, which then maximizes the amount of tax dollars that are stolen from us every year to feed this beast called healthcare, which is nothing really more than sick care, right? It's, it's the guise of compassion more than it is actual true compassion because most forms of modern healthcare are nothing more than, than poisoning you in disguise, poisoning you in the name of trying to help you. I mean, that's just my honest opinion about it. And you guys might have a different opinion, but I think most of you that follow me, 
know that and, and probably share that, that outlook. Um, there are millions of us already. When more people know, they will finally see the light. Yes, yeah, so the other commentary. I think, I think, I think ultimately this is the, this is the, the, the level of, of, of adaptation of this type of diet is going to be a direct reflection of this type of diet success. So the more people that do it and have success, that share their success with the people around them and that love them and that care about them, um, the more we're going to see the adaptation and the adoption of this diet, the more we're going to see people's choices affect the bank accounts of people growing the food wrong and farming the food wrong. And I think that's really how we're going to create change. It's not, it's not because we're creating a better system uh, to force these other companies. Uh, it's that you're going to force these other companies through your bank account. When you quit eating at McDonald's and Burger King and other places that poison you, um, you know, those companies then don't have the strength or the wherewithal to market, you know, their, their, Ne'er do well foods, and then and then you know we create a movement. So um, some of you would probably say that that'll never happen, and I, I to a certain extent agree. I, I'm not naive. I think I think there are a lot of people that are going to continue to eat fast food regardless of how unhealthy they are because they're foodies, and some people eat to live, and others live to eat. So the great thing about it is we all have a choice, and you get to live with your choice, or you get to die with your choice. You know, however you choose to see it. Let's see here. Danielle asking, is a gluten essentially bad for everyone? It's a great question, Danielle. I don't think we could, I don't think we can make that claim that it's bad for everyone with 100% degree certainty, because I think certainly, I also believe in the ability for humans to adapt and to evolve. And, and so, that means your gut has the capacity to adapt and evolve, um, digesting and processing different things. So I think the vast majority of modern humans today, gluten harms them. Uh, whether or not that's 100% across the board, we can't make that claim because nobody's tested 100% of people. But in my experience, um, and, and a lot of experts agree with this statement, um, gluten sensitivity um, as a general rule of thumb, is probably as prevalent as at least 40% of the entire population, which is quite a high number. Um, some experts believe it's 1%. Some believe it's 7%. Uh, myself and a few other colleagues believe it's closer to 40%, and so um, at least that much. Uh, hi, Dr. Osborne. Do you carry anything um, for cataracts? I've read that they can go away. Do you recommend surgery? Um, well, I don't, I don't recommend any medical treatment. I think you should talk to your doctor in that regard. But we do have a formula for the eyes called Focus, Laura. We can put a link up for you here. Um, and what it is, is it's a formula that contains a lot of nutrients that are very imperative for the eye to heal, repair, and function properly. So you might consider, uh, you might consider using that. Okay, let's see here. How is MCAS different from leaky gut? Corrine's asking, and do you have a certain type of MCAS if you have nausea on your flare? So for those of you who, who may, I'm assuming, Corrine, you mean mast cell activation syndrome. Um, the difference is that mast cell activation syndrome can cause leaky gut. Leaky gut is a phenomenon whereby you have microscopic pinholes in your gut lining that allow for your poop to leak into your bloodstream. And MCAS or mast cell activation can cause that to happen. So they're not technically, they're not the same thing at all. There are different things that can cause mast cell activation. Probably the most common cause of mast cell activation in my experience is mold, particularly house mold, environmental house mold. And a lot of times people have mold in their home, don't even see it. It's in their HVAC system. It's growing on the coils. It's growing inside their plenum. Uh, it's growing inside their ducts, and so they don't actually see like visible mold on the wall per se, but um, mold is definitely a trigger of mast cell activation. Probably Mike's been one of the most common. Now, I've seen gluten do it too. Gluten can be a trigger for mast cell. I actually had a, a young girl come to me years ago. This is probably over, over, over 15 years ago. But I remember it very well because she had been through the entire gambit at Texas Children's, which is you know, one of the famous children's hospitals here in, in Houston. And um, they were all scratching their head. There was nothing they could do for her, but she was, 
you know, she was chronically, chronically hiving, basically. And so her diagnosis was mast cell. And when we took her gluten-free, cleared it up. I mean, literally, it cleared it up in a matter of a few months. Uh, so, you know, there are different triggers for mast cells. Mast cells are just simply immune cells that are basically releasing aggressively histamine. And it's the histamine that creates the symptoms that a lot of people experience with that disease. And so if you can stabilize those mast cells, and if you can stabilize the reason as to why those mast cells are over aggressive and releasing too much, uh, too much of their chemical, then, then you can really, you can put an end to it. But I wouldn't put leaky gut in the same category as mast cell activation. I would say that mast cell can cause leaky gut, but so can lots of other things. Okay, is there any other like cereal type you can eat? You mean, is there like a cereal substitute is what I take from that question, Miranda. We did, didn't we just do a cereal review on a product? I think it was Lovebird. Correct. We have a, we'll put a, a, a review up for you, Miranda, on this product called Lovebird. And it's a grain-free cereal. Now that being said, you know, don't make it a staple food in your diet, but if you're using it as a transition to help you go gluten-free, there's nothing wrong with that. But I, I, I wouldn't eat any processed food product as a primary staple in the diet because it's, you know, there's a cost to processed food. And one of the biggest costs is you're getting calories without a lot of nutrients. And anytime that's the case, you end up creating nutritional deficits that will, that will stifle your, your progress. Let's see, let's go down in the center too. It'll go up just a fuzz. I like this comment. So Carrie says, just want to tell you that I'm so happy to have discovered you. I've had extreme joint pain in my hands for eight years. I love this testimony. And within two days of removing all grains, the pain has substantially decreased. Also in the past, when I've taken supplements, within a few days of taking the supplements, I would feel severely ill, joint pain everywhere, lethargic. I never knew until discovering your program that most supplements contain rice or corn, and that completely explains why I felt terrible when I've taken them. I always knew it. Uh, I always knew it was something that I, um, I always knew it was something that I was reacting to, but never knew what it was because they were all labeled gluten-free. Love that because so many people have that story, Carrie. Thank you for sharing, you know, where they're doing everything right or they think they are, but the problem is I'm actually doing a huge expose on this next, uh, is it next week? Uh, here in a week or two, we've got it. It's in our pipeline to, to film it, but, uh, and so I'll, I'll just give you an uh, kind of allude to the teaser of it, which is um, the food industry has bought and paid for the nutrition industry. And, and so what I mean by that is companies like ConAgra and Kellogg and um, Coca-Cola and PepsiCo, they're all giving money to the largest nutrition expert organization in the country. Like, so when you, when you say, okay, why do we see such conflicting nutrition information? When we go online and do general search, why do some people say gluten is perfectly fine? Why do some people say, no, it's, it's not good? Why do we see uh, people saying, like, like on the American Dietetic Association, one of the things that they have different recipes and a lot of their recipes and food ideas will spike your blood sugar. And this is the American Dietetic Association or Diabetic, rather, Association. And this content is being produced largely by dietitians, and, and that's what you have to understand is that that entire network of dietitians has been infiltrated by the food industry, and they're taking basically bribe money, right? They're taking millions of dollars from these food companies to sit down, shut up, and be quiet and lie to you. Honestly, that's, that's the truth of the matter, and shame on them for doing that. Now, now I'm not going to say that all dietitians are that way, because there's some great dietitians that are not a part of that organization that, that do a great job. But as a whole, the organization has been infiltrated by the food industry. And that's, you know, it's a conflict of interest, uh, because they're making money to lie to you. And that's why we have so much confusion. It's really not all that confusing. If you really just follow the rules of no grain, no pain, uh, you know, and, as, and aside from the obvious, you know, don't eat tons of processed food or make processed food your staple food. That, that really is, if I give you any one piece of dietary advice, is quit eating processed garbage. You're not going to increase your health or improve your health eating food that isn't good for you. And that's the cardinal rule. And we have so many experts, so-called experts, putting that garbage in front of us, telling us to feed it to our kids, right? Telling us that it's okay. Telling us that people who say it's not okay are 
you know, conspiracy theorists are, are blowing it out of proportion and, and they're liars and, and they're taking money to lie to you. And to me, that's that that's war because they're directly harming you. Anyway, I'm going to I'm going to get off that soapbox because we're going to get on it more in more detail later. I like this commentary, too. So Corrine says our family of four has ha, have eaten this way since 2017. It saved our lives. Um, thank you for that, Kareen. What about homemade almond or coconut flour crackers? There's nothing wrong with that, provided you're not allergic, you know, to almond or coconut as well. Um, so would oat bran be bad? Yeah, oat bran would be bad. Oats, out. If you want to follow no grain, no pain, oats are not allowed. Um, corn is not allowed. Rice is not allowed. Wheat, barley, rye, oats, corn, rice, sorghum, millet, amaranth, quinoa, and buckwheat are not allowed. So just remove those from the plate of opportunity um, and get busy with the work of figuring out what else you can eat that you enjoy, um, that is good for you, that won't poison you. Do you have a protocol to rid uh, mycotoxins? Or can I expect for them to clear since I have left the home that I suspect had mold? Yes, we do. Um, we have protocols for mycotoxins. Uh, I don't know that we have it published anywhere for just the general public, um, but I think it's in our pipeline this year to put that out, Laura, so be patient with us. Um, do you have any recommendations for dry macular degeneration? You know, if you're dealing with major eye disease, you really, really, there's no generalization that I'm going to give you that's going to just poof, uh, make your problem go away. I mean, the best advice I can give you dietarily would just do the no grain, no pain program. And beyond that, you need to get testing done. You need to have specific testing because with any kind of macular degeneration, it could be nutrient related. And if you don't know what nutrient deficiencies that you have, like zinc and vitamin A deficiency, copper deficiency, vitamin E deficiency, vitamin B12 deficiency, these can all contribute to that type of problem. And if you don't know, and you're just taking like say a general multivitamin, it may be not be enough of those nutrients to really get you the results or the outcome that you're after. So testing has to be the best recommendation that I can give you. So follow up with, you know, with a good doc or, or you know, a good practitioner who knows and understands how to properly test you for those things. Or just be patient. And uh, again, we'll have our nutrition testing out in this quarter. Uh, let's see here. Can gluten cause tinnitus? Yes, absolutely. Um, actually, we have it's an interesting story. Had a woman, this was, gosh, this was 15 or more years ago too. Her original reason that she was coming in to see me was a, she had tinnitus. She also had an autoimmune arthritis disease, so she was having a lot of back pain and hip pain. But at the end of the day, her biggest fear was that her, she wasn't going to be able to hear anymore. The tinnitus was getting so bad and she had a new daughter. And so her biggest fear was she wasn't going to be able to communicate, you know, with her family because she was losing her hearing. And in her case, Gluten played a big role. It wasn't just gluten. It was also something that mimics gluten, which was parasite. So there was a gluten issue combined with a parasite issue that was leading to neurological degradation of her, of her ear and um, creating her tinnitus. And once we figured those two things out and dealt with them, you know, she made a full recovery. Now, I'm not saying everyone's tinnitus is just that because it is a complicated thing. And there are a lot of other reasons why a person could develop tinnitus. But gluten is definitely one of those things that is on the list. Uh, let's see, a friend has health issues, asked about starting a healing journey by testing for gluten and food sensitivities and nutritional deficiencies. Which of your tests to start and order as a priority as afforded? Number one, hands down, genetic testing for gluten uh, because it's the biggest diet change you'll ever make uh, and it is probably the most profound diet change in my experience that most people make. Like if I, if I say, if I had to absolutely just prioritize and that way, I would say start with just getting tested for gluten, because if you can commit, if you are gluten sensitive and you can commit to the diet, 90% of the people that do that, in my experience, see wondrous change. I mean, very huge change, not small change, but pretty impactful change. Now, there are cases that where people don't. And this is where now you're looking at some of those other types of tests to try to see are there other triggers or are there other things that are going on. But I would always start with gluten uh, if you're trying to prioritize it. 
So um, take advantage of our DNA sale this, this week. Again, DNA 70 gets you um, a pretty big savings on that test for the new year. Mary Ellen says, Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you, Mary Ellen. Um, what light is appropriate for vitamin D? How often and how long should one use the light? Sperty, S-P-E-R-T-I, makes a really good vitamin D solar lamp. You can find them on, you know, on the internet. Um, but they, they make light, they make bulbs that produce UVB, which is what helps your skin produce vitamin D. And as far as the length of time, I, I just say follow the manufacturer's recommendations on exposure and then also take into consideration your skin tone. You know, if you're, if you're freckled and pale, uh, you know, less is, is more. If you're darker skinned and have more pigment in your skin, more may be necessary for you to achieve a, a similar result. So let's see here. Hello, Doc. Happy New Year. Why does taking potassium supplement make my anxiety reduce by 95%. I take vitamin B1. It has been reducing my potassium. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I understand that question. If you're asking me if taking potassium interferes with B1 or vice versa, I, I'm not sure. You have to re-ask that question so I can give you a better answer. Um, my wife, 72-year-old, generally healthy, but wondering about postprandial hypotension as far as underlying causes. So what I'm hearing you say, Richard, is that she eats and then her blood pressure drops. Um, one, of the, one of the biggest reasons that actually happens in the elderly is lack of muscle tone. Uh, muscle's a reservoir for blood and it also helps the heart pump blood and oxygen. And so, you know, I don't know where your wife is in terms of her physical fitness, but you know, that could be a potential reason why. One of the other reasons why it can just happen in general is that when you eat a meal, your body prioritizes blood flow to the small intestine to help you digest your food. This is why in nature you'll see anytime animals eat, you know, when they're done eating, one of the first things they do is they go lay down and take a nap. Um, and that's on purpose, right? Because we eat and we digest food when we're at rest. But most Americans have evolved into, they eat a big meal and then they try to do 25 things and, and you know, and, and uh, and be active, and that's not a good idea. You wanna eat and rest as a general trend. So I, I'm a fan of what they do further south of, of Texas, which is the siesta, right? So you eat and you take that nap, and that's a good way to help your body digest the food and recover. Um, what do you think about monk fruit? I think monk fruit's fine. Sometimes, though, monk fruit comes with erythritol, which is a, usually it's a corn-based sugar alcohol. So I would say if you're using monk fruit, beware of the erythritol and find a version that doesn't have it. Can nutritional deficiencies contribute to cavities? Oh, yes. Absolutely, Nicole. If so, which one? So lots of different ones, but, um, you know, zinc, vitamin A, calcium, magnesium, B vitamins. So lots of different ones. The best thing to do if you've you got an oral problem or you know, a cavity problem is, is, is get nutritionally tested. But beyond that, also understand that gluten causes, has been shown to cause enamel erosion. So it can actually lead to the enamel around your teeth that protect your teeth from developing cavities can be eroded as a result of gluten consumption. We can post a link to the research study that, that confirmed that if you'd like to check it out. But um, so diet change, in my opinion, is really critical. And so, you know, with cavities, you, we all know that the common thing would be to avoid sugar, but, and, you know, another less common thing would be no grain. And then beyond that, it's, you know, oral hygiene. There are certainly things that I think people should do on a regular basis for good oral hygiene. One is flossing and the other is water picking. Um, water picking with a, you know, you have a lot of different pump devices that pump water through the gaps in the teeth to make sure that, you know, you're not, if you, especially if you have food traps, that those food traps are not just sitting there festering and creating a problem for abnormal bacterial growth that could also erode and decay your teeth. Uh, let's see here. Do you, what, okay, doctor, your thoughts on body aches with flu and taking aminos? 
or creatine for body aches. Someone tried one and got really so. Yeah, so this is popular among people with fibromyalgia. It's to use amino acids and creatine, creatine monohydrate specifically, to reduce the aches in the muscle. Um, now, with as far as flu goes, I don't really recommend it. I mean, run the course of the flu. You're not going to get tremendous relief with creatine during a flu, um, where you might where you might get some relief. You know, with with flu would be with high doses of vitamin C, high doses of quercetin, high doses of N-acetylcysteine. But I, it wouldn't be my it wouldn't be my first go to to say take creatine while you have the flu if that if that's what you're referring to. Um, let's see here. Is there a good beginner's book about basic biology to start building a foundation from zero that you can recommend? Uh, so you're talking about basic biology, any good basic biology text <laughs> written 15 years ago or longer, because today the biology, you know, um, unfortunately we have people in our colleges who claim to be professors who um, are more of social science followers and social science is not a hard science, whereas biology is. And so they're trying to introduce social science into hard sciences to water it down. And, and anyway, we won't get into that. A good biology text, just start there. Um, and then from there, you know, generally speaking, you could do postgraduate courses or you could do college level courses in biology. Um, you could do, and then I would recommend biology. I would recommend biochemistry. I would recommend physiology. I would recommend anatomy. Um, as well, because structure is just as important as chemistry. And I would recommend pathology. Pathology and pathophysiology are all, those are all great courses. And in my opinion, they're very, very fundamental classes that a person should understand if they're trying to navigate this world effectively and, and really take the greater meaning from it and, and understand how to apply it in our own lives. Uh, let's see. Can you speak, Mary wants to know, can you speak a little about how the gene for gluten sensitivity passes from parents? If I have it, does that mean that one of my parents had non-celiac gluten sensitivity and never knew it? Yeah. Well, it, it, so, so there's two different genes that we, we analyze. And each every gene, if you understand genetics, every gene contains two pieces. Those pieces are typically referred to as alleles. So a genetic allele, you, so like if we're talking about one gene, you inherit one piece to that gene from your father and the other piece comes from your mother, right? So one allele from mom and one allele from dad equals your two alleles on your gene. And so example, if you have a beta one gene that has two positive markers for gluten sensitivity, that means each of your parents passed a positive marker down to you, which means each of your parents have a positive marker. Uh, so, so that's kind of the way that works. I, you know, you can learn more about that. We, again, we have a webinar that goes into the depth of that with graphics and everything else to help you better understand it. You can reach out to our customer service department and they can get you, probably get you set up for one of those. Um, let's see, I was in the hospital for two weeks in May of last year. The food was okay, but the grain-free stuff sure got repetitive after a few days. That's more of a commentary. I, I would just suggest if, well, one, if you're in the hospital, I don't expect that you're going to get gourmet anything and you're not going to, certainly you're not going to get a wide variety of selection because there's a limitation. Most hospitals don't serve healthy food anyway. Um, it's beyond the hospital where you really want to apply your, um, your learning, right? So check out Gluten-Free Society. We have a huge recipe database and you can, you know, you can type in breakfast, you can type in dessert, you can type in dinner and lunch. You know, you can filter whatever kind of recipe that you're looking for, but the recipes on Gluten-Free Society are all, um, they're all approved. And, and you can even, spec you can even uh, specify phase one of no grain, no pain versus phase two of no grain, no pain as you're doing your search. But navigate that because once you get through that learning curve, life gets super easy and food gets enjoyable again. It's that first 12 weeks or so where people are just confused about what to eat and their taste buds are changing. And that's gonna to happen to any of you who are just embarking on this. Your taste buds will change as you go through it and you will enjoy food again, I promise. 
Let's see. Um, I took enzymes months back. I wonder if that's why I can't digest foods or if it's just, no, enzymes don't prevent you from digesting food. They actually, actually help you digest food. Enzymes orally don't reduce your capacity to generate your own enzymes. So um, it's not that you took enzymes that created that scenario. You probably have something deeper going on, would be my thought. Mandy's asking, is it okay to drink a pre-workout vegan drink that has amino acids from non-GMO corn? No, don't recommend that. Um, can you talk a little more about the 3 a.m. waking and liver disease? We did a whole show on liver, Cheryl. I'll, I'll redirect you back to that. Um, and I think, because I, I think for me to get into the depth of that would take some time. And I think you'd be better served by having access to that show. Mel, can we put a link up to our uh, liver video or liver? Um, I think it's housed on Gluten Free Society on that archive. So, Cheryl, we're going to put a link up for you. Will no gluten or grain help with sarcoidosis? Yes. Um, I've seen several cases of sarcoidosis in my in my career and pretty much every one of them did extremely well um i've seen some not do well um as well like i've seen cases where where we actually suspected the ones that, that didn't do well we suspected mold in those situations uh and so remember sarcoidosis being an autoimmune condition uh, that gluten can contribute to. There are other things that contribute to autoimmune disease as well. So gluten, in my experience, has been very beneficial for people with sarcoidosis, but it's not always a, a cure-all either. I have been diagnosed with essential thrombocythemia, uh, and because of high platelet count, they said it was not a genetic thing, and I really don't like taking low-dose aspirin every day. You probably have... Uh, a nutrition deficiency somewhere in the B vitamin family, Jacqueline, would be my thought. It's not uncommon to see high platelet levels in people with B vitamin deficiency. I would start there. You might also start, well, you probably have, with that kind of a diagnosis, you've probably already seen a hematologist. But, um, you know, beyond that, I would get your diet dialed in. Um, because I see, I see both high and low platelet issues oftentimes are resolved with diet change and you know gluten free is a great place to start grain free is an even better place to start uh, and then beyond that it's unique to the individual uh, are pumpkin seeds okay in regard to lectins pumpkin seeds are fine um, generally speaking now now unless you're allergic to them or you have a reaction to them but as a, as a general rule of thumb they're pretty easy to digest and break down and they're okay is there any cracker that's gluten-free? Yeah, lots of them. One of the better companies that actually makes an organic grain-free uh, cracker is Simple Mills. Um, so if you look that company up, they have some organic varieties, uh, pretty good crackers if you're looking for something in the grain-free realm. Now, that being said, crackers as a staple food does not a healthy person make. So you know, my advice to anybody who's trying to become healthy, who's sick and trying to get healthy, is you're not gonna do that on foods that are highly processed. So minimize that as much as you can, but if you just have that craving and you're, and, you, and you're trying to pick the least damaging thing, that's a good option that you could go with. Not sure I understand the context of the question, but the question is what about vitamin C liquid? Most vitamin C liquids are corn derivative don't recommend them. You know, I have two, two types of vitamin C that I recommend. One's a powder that you can mix with water and drink it, and the other is a pill that you can take. Uh, the product is called Detox C, and if, so if you're asking about my opinion on vitamin C, that's, that's my opinion. That formula is the best, hands down. How do you feel about celiac mimicking? Define what you mean by celiac mimicking. There are things that mimic gluten if that's what you're referring to, for example, soy can mimic gluten. Um, yeast overgrowth can produce proteins that mimic gluten. So I, I'm not sure what you mean, Marilyn. Maybe, maybe give me better clarity and I can answer you better. What carb would you eat? Um, 
than before a workout really early in the morning. I've always had buckwheat, but I do get joint pain with it. So I don't eat before my workout. One of the things that, you know, and this is different for different people, but I, I like to go work out at 6, 5.30, 6 in the morning. And um, I don't eat. I go fasted. One of the things that happens when you work out, especially if you're doing any kind of high-intensity interval training, um, is working out can actually loosen the junctions in your gut lining and it creates a transient leaky gut. So I don't want any food on my gut when I'm going to go work out. Now I'll eat, I'll work, I'll eat after my workout, but I just won't do it before because I don't want that to happen. I don't want that permeability to occur during my workout where I've got something on my stomach and that's now penetrating into my bloodstream. So as a general rule, I don't recommend eating before you work out. Uh, question about copper-infused water. So Karen says, I've been drinking copper-infused water and someone said I need to get tested first before I drink it for copper levels. You know, I, I don't know what you mean by copper-infused water from a dose perspective, um, but if it's, you know, if it's in the milligram dose range, it's not something I, I agree. It's not something I'd recommend that you drink on a daily basis without, without understanding what your copper status is. Uh, tell me how buffered C is preferable to non-buffered vitamin C. The biggest reason is that buffered C, remember ascorbic acid or ascorbate is an acid. So when you buffer it, you basically you neutralize the acid. And the way we buffer it is we use minerals. So we use magnesium and potassium and, uh, and other minerals to buffer our vitamin C. So that if you, let's just say you've been eating gluten your whole life and you've got erosion in your stomach and you try to take vitamin C to improve your health, but because you have an erosion in your stomach, the ascorbic acid, the acid component causes irritation to that area where you lack lining. And now that product that could be helping you is actually hurting you. But if you buffer it, that doesn't happen. And that's the main reason why you want to buffer it, um, especially if you're new to this diet, new to this lifestyle. Um, the other reason why you want to buffer it um, is like with any other thing, you, you don't want to take um, high doses, you know, especially if you've got a cold or flu, uh, and, you're, and you're wanting to take 15 grams or so of vitamin C, which a lot of people do, they really get the doses up when they're, when they're sick to try to overcome their illness quicker. Um, you know, again, you wanna buffer that so that you don't over, you know, overexpose yourself to that acid. Is pickled the same as fermented? Yeah, I mean, it's a form of, of fermenting where you have to be careful with pickled foods is the, the chemical additives, the dyes, the sulfites that are used in a lot of pickled jarred products. So you just gotta make sure that they're not using, you know, those, those artificial preservatives that aren't good for you. High levels of Epstein-Barr IgG. What, what can cause high levels of Epstein-Barr IgG? A um, lot of things. I, every, I mean, the reality is, is the vast majority of humans have Ig or have Epstein Barr uh, in them. And generally, what happens is your titers can go up. Your antibody titers with Epstein Barr will go up when you're under assault from other things. Um, so, for example, one one reason we might see it is somebody who's gluten sensitive and they're eating gluten all the time. They're, generally, if you test their Epstein Barr, it's higher. Um, and if you take them gluten free, their Epstein Barr values start to come down. Another very common reason we see Epstein-Barr tire, Epstein titers go up is mold exposure uh, because mold is a drain and attacks on the immune system. So what happens, that Epstein-Barr starts to creep up. So very rarely, in my opinion, is dealing with Epstein-Barr the right move to make. I know a lot of people probably disagree with that and that's okay. We all have our opinions. But in my experience, um, usually there's something else triggering the elevation of Epstein-Barr antibodies and not necessarily Epstein-Barr itself. Mary Ellen says, you've totally changed my life. I feel 100% better. I can't eat any grains. I get very sick now that I changed my diet. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for you know, chiming in and, and sharing your testimony. What are dietary agitators to intermittent joint pain, stiffness and joint pain and not from a deficiency? So other things beyond nutritional deficiencies that can cause joint pain, joint stiffness, um, overtraining <laughs> could be one. 
when you're doing your exercise, you're not tending your muscles properly. A lot of people will work out cold. They'll go into the gym and just start throwing weight around and that can lead to pain. Um, you need to be properly warmed up. You need to have proper blood flow going to the muscle that you're trying to work out. You need to have good flexibility to the muscle that you want to work out. So those are physical reasons typically why we might see intermittent pain. You might have a, a nerve impingement you know, from your spine where that nerve is traversing to feed that particular joint or muscle and that nerve impingement is reducing the electrical conductivity of energy into that region, creating pain and the lack of capacity for healing. It could be that you're too sedentary and that the joint pain is occurring because you don't move the joint enough. The joints don't have a direct blood supply. The only way they get nourishment is through movement. And so cartilage, again, you have to, it's bathed by a fluid called synovial fluid. And if you don't have adequate movement and you're sedentary, then you're not gonna get nourishment to that cartilage. And so it will start to deteriorate and you can develop arthritis in those joints. You know, beyond, beyond those things, there's certain bacterial abnormalities that certainly can contribute to joint pain. Klebsiella and Pseudomonas are two types of gram-negative bacteria that can produce toxins that can damage muscles and joints. Yeast overgrowth is an example of something that can. High levels of sugar uh, in the diet can also can do it. And other food allergens, it's very, very common to see, even beyond gluten, if you're already gluten-free, to see other foods that can contribute to joint pain because for you as a unique person, those foods could be inflammatory to you. So lots of things to consider. This is again why when people come to me, it's all about testing because the possibilities are literally endless and it could be more than one possibility. It's very rare that a person has like one thing wrong in this, in this family of triggers. And usually the average person I see usually got more than 15 triggers. And so maybe they knew about two or three of them and they were addressing those two or three that they knew about, but they had these other 12 over here that they weren't addressing and so they weren't getting better until we were able to figure out that those were also triggers. So um, hopefully that sheds a little light on, on that for you. I know immediately if I'm exposed to gluten within uh, minutes develop sores in my mouth, a red rash on my nose and my stomach burns. That's awesome because a lot of people have, gluten can mask its own toxicity. One of the, one of the byproduct proteins of gluten breakdown is called gluteomorphin, which behaves like morphine. And so it can actually, for some people who eat gluten, they don't feel symptomatic because they're breaking their gluten down into a morphine compound that blocks their ability to perceive pain. So they actually eat gluten and feel better. And this we see sometimes when people have gluten withdrawals where they're getting off of gluten and they feel worse. It's because they're taking away a source of food-based morphine and so their body's going through withdrawals and they actually hurt more. So those of you who go on no grain, no pain diet, get through that first two weeks. For some of you, there is that transition where you could actually feel worse as opposed to feeling better in that first few weeks. Yes, yeah, so some, some commentary about, you know, a lot of food products, a lot of these seals that you see on products like American Heart Association, American Diabetic Association, uh, or even non-GMO, these seals don't really have any value. They're more than anything, they're a seal that that food producer had to buy in order to put it on the label. And so, a big part of whether that seal has any value is the belief system behind the organization that has the seal. So like, would I trust the American Heart Association seal? No, because how long has that association been around and what is their general guidelines toward heart disease? And they don't recognize the association all that greatly of, of diet, especially not of grains and heart disease. And so, you know, of course, they're going to put their seal of approval on garbage products like Honey Nut Cheerios, which is nothing more than highly processed oats with sugar in it. And that's not healthy for anyone's heart, but, um, but the general consumer, the general consensus of average consumers are that oat, oats lower cholesterol because the general person believes that cholesterol is even something you need to have lowered. And I, again, we don't have time to get into cholesterol today, but um, so maybe I'm going too deep into that topic. But yeah, anytime you see you know the seal of approval of any entity on a product it's a marketing ploy to try to sell more of that product usually to people who are uneducated about um, diet and nutrition so don't fall victim to those marketing ploys learn how to read the ingredients on the food label that's the most important thing it doesn't matter what the seal says the seals uh, virtually have no meaning and they can be bought
Uh, let's see, Gene's asking about red light therapy after a lot of dental x-rays. Are you a fan? Yeah, I love red light therapy. I think it's a, I think it's a good therapy, and for many, it's very, very beneficial um, uh, to stimulate the healing process. So more power to you. If that's what you're doing and you find it helpful, keep doing it. Grain-free cosmetics or skincare products. I can't seem to find any product lines that are safe. I tend to get hives randomly from skincare products, and it's frustrating. You know, this is one industry we haven't really carried, been able to lock down because skincare companies change their ingredients so frequently that by the time we get around to making a recommendation, you know, people that are listening to that recommendation are coming back to us and saying, hey, now this product has something you know, that's corn in it or something that's rice or something that has wheat in it. And so by the time we get around to realizing that, you know, we've, we've been recommending a product and now we're recommending something that they change their ingredients on and so now it's hurting people. So the best thing you really can do is, is, is um, call individual companies. But I, I would say less is more in the cosmetic industry. I know that, that you know, many women may not feel the same way uh, because, you know, vanity is an important part of quality of life and that, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying vanity is a problem because I know in general people want to look nice and want to look professional and want to look good and cosmetics can help with that. But I, I would just generally say go with as natural of a line as you can find. And so some of the cosmetics, for example, they use minerals for their colors and, and they use powders that are grain free in nature. And so those there, I know there are some brands out there. That, again, I'm, I'm not going to quote a brand because uh, I, I don't know whether these companies have changed their ingredients, but um, I would encourage you to just stay steady. Maybe somebody in the audience who's, who's currently using a product that is grain-free could chime in for Carrie and give her some better advice than what I'm willing to do. Uh, how does one increase white blood cells? Depends. I mean, white blood cells being too low, that could happen for several different types of reasons. Certainly gluten can cause low white blood cell counts. B vitamin deficiency can cause low white blood cell counts. Mold can definitely cause low white counts. So it just depends on what it is that's causing yours. So like if you were in mold as an example, how would you increase your white counts? You'd have to get out of the mold. Um, if, if you had low white counts because you're B12 deficient, you'd have to make sure you were getting adequate B12 in your diet to bring that count back up. Uh, my cousin is blood type O. He eats oats every morning. Could this have contributed to him having a numb right leg? He's done a lot of lead work in the past. Could that be related to numbness? Yeah, lead can cause neuropathy. Um, lead displaces calcium and magnesium, which are critical electrolytes for neurological function. Um, so lead, if he's, if he's been exposed to high quantities of lead. But oat, you know, and any other form of gluten is also associated with neuropathy. The, the, the thing that's curious in this case is that it's only in his right leg, according to what you're saying, Dave. And so generally when you have a unilateral neuropathy or a unilateral numbness, it's not typically a systemic problem, although that, that, that's not always true. You could have a unilateral and have a systemic problem, but you, a lot of times where there's a neuropathy and it's only on one side, it's physical in nature, meaning there's like a disc herniation that's in, impending on a nerve root, or there's a nerve root that is compressed, um, and and that you know that all that should probably be investigated. I would encourage your friend to follow up with a with a you know a good doctor who understands physical care and maybe even get an MRI and an X-ray of that spine to make sure he doesn't have radicular neuropathy as a result of of some type of physical compression of a nerve. Um, that's traversing down his down his his spine, especially the sciatic nerve, uh, that can create that type of neuropathy. The piriformis entrapment syndromes can create that kind of neuropathy. So, again, there's a lot of possibilities there. Um, what's good for breakfast? I'm sensitive to eggs, meat, and vegetables. Um, yeah, Pat, go to the Gluten Free Society and just check out our our. Um, we have a whole lot of breakfast recipes there, uh, and and you know just select in the filter, select egg free as an option and you should be able to find plenty. Uh, do you sell genetic tests? Yes, yeah, so you must have come late to the show today, but um, yeah, DNA70 is the coupon code you can use today. Um, can we put the link up for the genetic testing for Pat? Pat, we're gonna put that link 
just below in the chat box for you for genetic testing. Oh, so okay, Mohammed comes back with the question asking earlier about, or about potassium saying, um, I take potassium supplements for anxiety and it has lowered my anxiety by 95%. How come? He just wants to know why. Um, one of the reasons is potassium is an electrolyte, so it helps your neurological cells communicate. And sometimes anxiety is caused by a miscommunication amongst neurological cells. So if you were really low on potassium, it actually can cause anxiety. So taking that potassium, probably because you were deficient, has helped your anxiety, mainly because your anxiety was being caused by potassium deficiency in the first place. Um, try to get a psychiatrist to measure your nutritional status. It just doesn't happen much these days, although I know a few really great psychiatrists that are orthomolecular in nature. They do measure these things before they reach for these high-powered drugs, but it's just hard to come by those those really um, nutritionally related doctors. So almond came up on a food sensitivity test. It depends on which food sensitivity test you had done. I mean, I'm not a fan of a lot of food sensitivity tests because of the methodology, the testing methodology that's implemented. So a lot of, a lot of these common popular tests that you, you know, that you can buy online, the vast majority of them are measuring IgG, uh, which two problems with IgE. Number one, you get a ton of false positive, meaning you could have a whole list of things that you're being told you're sensitive to, but in reality, you're not. And, and number two, you get a lot of false negative. So I'm not, that's why I'm not a fan of that specific type of test, Pat. So it just depends on the kind of testing that you had done. If you had IgG testing done and you came back almond sensitive, you know, I, I, you know, if you came into my practice and, I, and you showed me that test result, I would test you differently and I would tell you to ignore that IgG result. But uh, without having that background information, it's hard for me to, to tell you. But yes, if you're truly reactive to almonds, then warrior bread would not be an option for you because it has almond flour in it. I like this. Mary says, um, gluten-free for years, but didn't give up beer until 12 months ago. Psoriasis is finally almost gone. I love it. Yeah, beer. Even the gluten-free ones, like a lot of the ones they claim to be gluten-free are made from sorghum, which um, I find that most people have tremendous problems with. Um, chocolate recommendations. We've done a few reviews on chocolate. Um, Hue is a good company. They make a good organic chocolate and then I think what's the other one evolution what was it evolved it's evolved chocolate I think is the name but you can check if you check out our YouTube um, look at our food reviews because we have a whole playlist on food reviews on our YouTube channel and uh, we've got we've got a lot of different reviews in chocolate there are a few that, that are there and you can check those out Is colloidal silver healthy? I, I wouldn't, it, may, I would reframe that question, Inga, not to say is colloidal silver healthy? Because I, I, I wouldn't recommend somebody take colloidal silver every day, but can colloidal silver be beneficial in certain situations? I would say yes. I just think it depends on the premise of why you're using it and what you're using it for. How do you know if you have mold in your body and how do you know and how would you get rid of it? So there's, that's a deep question um, because you can have mold in your body, but you can also have mycotoxins in your body and they're not the same thing. Um, you know, for example, mold can grow in your sinus cavities and you can have a mold infection that acts like an upper respiratory infection. A lot of doctors mistake them for bacterial infections. You can have mold growing in your lungs uh, causing an infection. You can have mold growing on your skin I mean, that's what jock itch is, or ringworm, uh, tinea corporis. Um, those are all molds. You get a mold or, or fungus growing in your GI tract, candida, as an example. Now, we all have some candida, but it, it's, it's an overgrowth more than it is just the presence of some small amount, as much as more of it has to do with if it's an overgrowing, 
to the capacity that it started to generate inflammatory damage. So there are a lot of different ways doctors can do cultures and test. You know, doctors can culture your sinuses and, and check to see whether or not mold is growing in your sinus cavity. They can do sputum cultures of lung fluids. They can do cultures of, of stool for your GI tract uh, and skin cultures as well. If you suspect mold may be causing, you know, because it can cause a number of different types of skin rashes and skin conditions. So if you're, if you're trying to analyze whether or not you have mold growing on you, those are great tests to ask your doctor to run. If you're trying to understand whether or not you're being poisoned by environmental mold, then kind of the best way to understand that, if it's not obvious, if you don't have obvious, you know, water leak or damage or mold growing on the wall in your house, is to measure a level of something called a mycotoxin in your urine. And that, so there are different ways to go about that. But there are different mycotoxins. And so having a comprehensive valuation that way could help you understand whether or not you're being exposed to environmental molds that are poisoning you, which is different than a mold infection. So they're not the same thing. And a lot of people get them confused. Unfortunately, a lot of doctors get them confused because they do a culture and they rule out that you have a mold infection, but they're not ruling out whether or not you're being exposed to environmental mold that's poisoning you. Again, two different types of, of things or entities that can, that can damage you. Let's see here. Quercetin has been advised um, for the COVID thing. Is that anti-inflammatory helpful for healing gluten damage? It, sure, it certainly can be supportive. One of my favorite combos is mixing quercetin with vitamin C um, because when you combine them, they work synergistically together and they impact the same biochemistry as a steroid impacts. So the, the ability to help regulate a healthy inflammatory response is, is, is bar none fantastic. So uh, mixing C and quercetin is a good thing. We have, we have again, Detox C, and then we have a, another product called Ultra Q, which is a high, high potency quercetin uh, enhanced with pomegranate for bioavailability. My white count is low due to chemotherapy. I read that B vitamins are what contribute to an improvement of white cells. What are your thoughts? Yes, you're exactly right. Uh, if you're going through chemotherapy, um, yeah, your B count or your, your um, you develop anemia, right? So your white counts, even your red or your, oftentimes your platelet counts can be low as well because many chemotherapies affect the, the stem cells in your bone marrow, which are responsible for generating red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. So many of the chemotherapies affect B vitamins. So taking B vitamins is one of the best things you can do, in my opinion, if you're trying to support your body as you're going through that process of cancer treatment. Now, uh, we won't get into my opinions on, on chemotherapy, but I think if you've made a decision you feel comfortable with and your white counts are low, B vitamins are definitely something that you're gonna wanna consider. Uh, will nutrient testing be available soon? Yeah, I mentioned earlier, we're, we're rolling it out this quarter. I think we're waiting on a few, you know, the devil in the detail type things that have to be figured out. What supplement do I recommend to reduce high cholesterol? I don't. I don't recommend supplements to lower cholesterol. I think lowering cholesterol is the wrong mechanism of action to approach. I don't think cholesterol has anything to do with heart disease unless you have something called familial hypercholesterolemia, which is a genetic form of super high cholesterol. Um, but if we're just talking about, generally speaking, your cholesterol is under 300, I, I don't recommend any kind of supplement to try to lower your cholesterol. I recommend diet change, I recommend exercise, I recommend good quality sleep, I recommend sunshine, I recommend all the things that um, you should be doing to promote your good health. But I don't recommend thinking of cholesterol as a reason as to why people ever developed heart disease. I think that whole cholesterol theory of disease is an entire myth. That's my opinion on cholesterol in a nutshell. Um, are you still taking on new clients? Yeah, we, we take on a few hundred a year. Um, you can contact our office. Um, if you go to drpeterosborne.com, maybe we can put that link up in the feed. Um, you can, there's a button there that, that has a contact us info on it. <laughs> Do you have a good way to prepare beets so they don't taste like dirt? Um, I don't like beets, so I don't really, in my house, we don't eat a lot of beets. So maybe I'll ask my chef and come get back with you, Suzette. Which state are you based in? I'm in, I'm in Texas. And I'm not a primary care provider. Um, I, I don't practice, uh, by trade, I, I, you know, I graduated chiropractic school and practiced for years in that regard. But today I'm currently 
uh, I'm not practicing you know, under that, under that license. I actually I do nutritional consultation, so I, I don't consider myself a primary care provider um, in that regard. Now, if you want to see me for nutritional consultation, that's, you know, again, that's, that's something that, that I do do, but um, as far as you know, diagnosing and all that, I, it's not something I do. Um, do you, okay, so do I have a food, so that following up to the other a minute ago, do I have a food sensitivity test? Yes, Pat. Um, let's put a link to that on the YouTube side for Pat, and you can read more about that testing and, and um, the differences between what most people test for and what we actually test for. Would I feel as great by avoiding dairy as I do when I avoid grains and gluten? Probably. Um, a lot of people do, Raza. That's, there's a term called the gluten-free, casein-free diet. And one of the reasons why is the modern dairy that we produce on scale farms in the, in the U.S. and in other European culture countries is, is um, it's an, it's something called A1 or alpha-1 casein. And alpha-1 casein, is an, it can be autoimmune-inducing for a lot of people and can create a lot of inflammation, but it can also mimic gluten. So this is one of the reasons why um, I don't recommend dairy on the no-grain, no-pain diet, at the very least for the first many months as you try to balance out the inflammation. Uh, if you're, if you're grain-free but eating dairy and still struggling, and dairy is, is a very likely culprit that you'd want to look at removing. Let's see here. Go down a little on the left side. So an antimicrobial, if you're using intestinal defense, that's a good microbial support product. We also have something called um, microbial balance. I think that's on. I think we have that on Gluten Free Society. Um, maybe we can. Maybe Gene, we can put a link up for that uh, for you. How do I counter a lot of diarrhea when I'm going gluten free? Um, if I go gluten free and experience a lot of diarrhea, how do I counter that? One of the best ways to, you know, to to try to counter that again is just generically is to be on a good probiotic. Now we have several options, Michael, that, that I encourage people to do when they're going gluten-free. Um, but the most powerful option is called ultrabiotic defense. And that's a mixture of, of different strains of bifidobacter and lactobacillus that have been shown in research to relieve a lot of the gluten-related symptoms in, in celiacs. And that's why we formulated it that way, be, was to be supportive of people who are embarking on that new journey. So that would be the thing I would encourage you to take in support of going gluten-free. Um, let's see, go down a little bit more on the left if we got anything else. Is the no grain, no pain suitable for vegetarian? Yeah, you can, you can pull no grain, no pain off on a vegetarian. I have a lot of, a lot of my clients are vegetarians and, and pull off no grain, no pain beautifully well. Okay, uh, does your multi, I've uh, got a couple more here. I'll, I'll just wrap it up. Does your multi uh, vitamin supplementing com, uh, completely replace B12 and B complex? For some, it does, Sue, it does have meaningful doses of B vitamins, and so it may for you, but for some it doesn't. It's not enough, and it just depends. This is one of the reasons why I recommend testing. But again, it, if you're in a place where you haven't had testing and you're just trying to get a uh, high-quality, high-powered nutrient in you, ultra-nutrients is one of the best places to start. Um, I've got nail fungus on my toe, and I've taken medication for it twice, but it will not get rid of it. What do you suggest? You've got mold in your home, most likely, Jay. Um, if you've got fungus growing on your skin or under your nails, uh, one, of the un one of the unfortunate things about fungus growing on your body is it's an insight. In my experience, it's an insight that you're being immunocompromised, meaning that something else is compromising your immune system's ability to fight fungus that are everywhere that, but typically are not strong enough to start growing on you uh, because your immune system can beat them up, can kick them out, so to speak. Um, so generally, when we see fungus growing on people's skin or under their nail beds, it's because they're immunocompromised. There are a lot of reasons why a person can be immunocompromised, 
But that's the question you have to answer. So treating it with a topical thing is not going to make it go away. It may temporarily reduce it. It may temporarily make it go away, but it'll just keep coming back if you're immunocompromised. So there's four primary reasons uh, people can be immunocompromised. Number one is they're being poisoned by their food. Number two, they're being poisoned by chemicals. Sometimes the chemicals are in their food. Number three, they're being poisoned by microbes. So they have a microbial imbalance. Uh, usually this is common after people to have had years of antibiotic use or years of certain types of medications that affect the microbiome. And then the last reason would be nutritional deficit. You don't have adequate vitamins and minerals to help your immune system do its job. Nutrients are necessary for immune system function. If, you, if you're vitamin C deficient, your immune system's not gonna work as well. If you're zinc deficient, it won't work as well. Uh, if you remember when we went through this pandemic thing, everybody was jumping to zinc and quercetin and vitamin D and vitamin A and vitamin C. Why? Because those nutrients are needed by your immune system to help fight. And if you're low in any of those things, you are compromised. Your immune system becomes compromised and then, and then you can get things like fungus growing on you and under your nail bed. So find out why your immune system is compromised. It's the best tip I could give you. And that means working, probably working with a good doctor to help you understand that and doing some appropriate testing. So I think we went over. Um, so we're going to wrap it up. Thanks for joining me today for this live Q&A. Make sure you come back on Tuesday. We're going to be going into the depths of you know, fighting autoimmune disease, how to overcome it with diet changes, no grain, no pain, part two. So we're going to be diving into phase two of the diet. If you've got specific questions about phase two, make sure you join us. If you're new to this whole thing, definitely make sure you join us. The information you might learn could very well save your life. Remember, autoimmune disease is the one of the top killers in the global world of industrialized countries. It's one of the top killers of women specifically, especially women under the age of 65. It's uh, some argue it's, it's the number one cause of death. Others argue it's in that top 10. So I think it depends on whose statistics that you read, but we know it's a major cause of death. And one in seven Americans have autoimmune disease. So, you know, if you're in a crowded room, the, the likelihood that somebody, maybe a few people in that room have an autoimmune problem because they're eating wrong and they're, and they're doing it wrong, uh, that likelihood is very high. And so come and learn how you can change your own life and when you change your own, they're going to see the change in you and they're going to ask you what you did. And then you can share this information and hopefully help save another life as well and help us total reach 100 million lives because that's our goal here on the Dr. Osborne channel. So thanks for tuning in. We'll see you Tuesday night. Have a fantastic weekend. One of our flagship products, Gluten Shield was designed to support people on their gluten-free journey. It's especially beneficial for those just learning about their gluten sensitivity. There's an average 12-week learning curve in that. It was designed to protect from accidental gluten exposure and cross-contamination, as well as to support and protect you during travel or eating out. It was not designed to help you eat more gluten. That's a key. Now, Gluten Shield key ingredients include proteolytic enzymes, and something called DPP-4. Now this enzyme's been shown to break down the proline and glutamine bonds in gluten proteins. It also contains a proteolytic enzyme blend designed to help you break down proteins. Remember, years of gluten-induced intestinal and stomach damage can sometimes inhibit that process. It contains carbohydrate-busting enzymes that support the digestion of the starchy components of grains and it contains a very specialized probiotic called Bifidobacterium infantis. Bifidobacterium infantis is a specialized probiotic strain that has been shown in research studies to aid in the breakdown of difficult to digest carbohydrate elements found in grains. It's also been shown with celiacs to reduce intestinal symptoms. It also helps support overall digestion. Now, Gluten Shield also contains an herbal blend for additional digestive support. It contains fennel, which aids in digestion and supports relaxation of the smooth muscle lining the GI tract. It contains ginger, traditionally used for nausea and upset stomach. It's also believed to promote digestion by increasing the flow of saliva, gastric juices, and bile. It also contains peppermint, used to support digestion and to provide relief from GI discomfort. Now, recommended use for Gluten Shield, if you're taking it for daily maintenance, just take one capsule with each meal or snack for supporting digestion 
and daily gluten protection. For enhanced performance, take two capsules with each meal or snack for travel or eating out. Now, if you want it for aggressive use, take three capsules with each meal or snack. This is best for gluten-free newbies, those who are new to the gluten-free diet and not quite sure whether they're avoiding all of the gluten in their environment.